Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. I'm Amy Eisman. I'm the director of the master's program in media entrepreneurship here at American University. We're one of your hosts this week, this evening with WAMU, also a co-sponsor. And also, I um, want to promise you a lively evening to get you over the depression of the Nats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, before I introduce our guests, I want to thank a few people here. But first, I want to share a few words about why we are here today. There are two ways to look at the rollicking, frolicking, topsy-turvy world of media and information today. Um, where nouns like Facebook and Instagram and Storify become first. I Storified it, Facebooked him, I Instagrammed it. One way to handle the new reality is to lament the way things used to be in newspapers or in TV or in industries. Or, like many of you here tonight, we can decide to jump in and play, think of new ideas, explore new ways to pay for those ideas, create new products, and have the confidence to let some of them fail. That's why we here at American University started a new program in media entrepreneurship, um, which I'd like the students who are in that program to raise their hands so everybody can acknowledge them. Woohoo! They're the first class. And why the smart folks at WAMU helped co sponsor this program, both WAMU and the Media Entrepreneurship Program together. So, with us tonight are two people who love the idea of rolling up their sleeves and diving in. The moderator is Jan Schaefer. She's the nationally known expert in media entrepreneurship and an undisputed leader in innovative ways to think about journalism. She's the entrepreneur in residence on campus, and she's also the executive director of JLab, AU's Institute for Interactive Journalism. Jan is also a Pulitzer Prize winner for the Philadelphia Inquirer, who left daily journalism in 1994 to lead groundbreaking initiatives in civic journalism, interactive journalism, and citizen media ventures. She has awarded roughly 70 startups, Jen, with mm -hmm. funding um, over the recent years. She knows how to spot winners, so I would, you know, cozy up to her. And uh, she's got about 20 more in the pipeline that are on their way to fruition right now. Um, our main speaker is Vijay Ravindran, the senior vice president and first ever chief digital officer for the Washington Post Company, which he joined uh, about three years ago? Two three and a half. Yeah. Three and a half years ago. Vijay defines the contemporary intrapreneur. He focuses on digital news product development from the inside. Vijay founded the WAPO Labs, which develop experimental news products, some of which he will discuss tonight, like The Fold. Have all of you heard of The Fold? All right. Well, OK. <laughs> 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 okay. Next time, you'll all raise your hands. Yeah. Uh, he also works with Social Code, um, a Facebook, Twitter, dedicated advertising company. Earlier, Vijay worked as the chief technology officer at Catalyst, a startup for political technology that built a national voter database and data mining tools for political campaigns. And he was a technology director at Amazon.com. Finally, I want to introduce a few other people. Our new dean, Dr. Jeff Rutenbeck, who has been so enthusiastic about the entrepreneurship program, you wouldn't know he's only been here for a few months. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Karen Mathis, the head of WAMU, and also one of the people responsible for this evening. I also want to introduce, let's see, Roseanne, are you in here? Uh, Associate Dean uh, of the School of Communication, Roseanne Robertson. I've seen a couple division directors, John Douglas of the Film Division, uh, FMA Division. Uh, Jill Olmsted, are you here? Mm -hmm. I see Jill Olmsted, she's the division director for journalism, and thank you all for being here. For being here. Really made this event happen tonight. Um, Chris, where are you? Yep. Chris is the digital media director at WAMU and also a student in the MAME program, so he wears a couple hats. Um, in fact, after he set up this event, he has to go probably do homework about it. Um, <laughs> Sharon Metcalf is our director of strategic partnerships, and Kim Husted is her assistant, and they are responsible for making this happen tonight. So here's what we're going to do we're going to have a conversation for about uh, 45 minutes um, or so, and we'll close out with questions, uh, Q&A from the audience. For those of you who are tweeting, the hashtag is DC Startup Forum. You need to do it on, on um, cellular or mobile through 3G or 4G. So, thank you. Amy, thank you. 
Well, um, we're going to start with a Q&A format, basically. And I, I've learned from pre-interviewing uh, Vijay that he's, he's a great uh, talker. So, <laughs> um, but uh, well, let's start. We're delighted to have you. You're doing exciting things. And I, I would tell us, you know, what was in Donnie Graham's mind when he hired you? What was, what was your mandate? What did he ask you to do? Yeah, well, um, you know, Don Graham, the CEO and chairman of the Washington Post Company, and son of Catherine Graham, longtime CEO and publisher, you know, he, I was contacted right before the 2008 elections. I was working in uh, democratic politics with my uh, technology startup. And I think what he saw and what um, I think since then has proven to be very true is that there's incredible pressure on um, media companies, companies that where journalism is a core part of the product. And uh, I think we all know about you know the, the reasons why print journalism is in big trouble and what's going on on the business side there. Um, but he also saw a diff another thing, which was that the digital media businesses that were also uh, built on journalism, they were under so much pressure that it's very hard for them to pull themselves out of the box, that they're working quarter to quarter, year to year. And there's such tremendous change flowing through how information is presented to consumers that when you're in the middle of trying to hit your goals for this quarter or the next, that it's very hard to then pull yourself out and go, well, everything is moving this way, and I need to maybe ignore to some extent or not be burdened by whether this is the most profitable idea right this moment, and instead think about what the consumer experience of the future were. So he, um, hired me with a very simple mission statement, which was, I'd like you to innovate a next generation news experience for our company. And, uh, and with that, um, I have since then tried to uh, fill in what that could mean. Uh, I've uh, came in and uh, really tried to craft a role for myself and subsequently the team that I've built that works separately, but also with the Washington Post and the other media properties like Slate and The Root and Foreign Policy. So um, what that's translated from the next generation news experience is, you know, can we develop products that um, develop consumer audiences and help show the way? Can we develop prototypes that meaningfully influence strategy and decision making across our media properties? And along the way, can we build critical infrastructure um, to launch those digital properties that the that the Washington Post and Slate and our other businesses can take advantage of. And the, the metric I've used there is I want the same underlying tools that um, I had when I was running um, parts of Amazon's website available to the journalists and the product managers at the Washington Post. And that was not the case when, when I started. That's ambitious. Well, unpack for us some of those next-gen uh, news products. I mean, you've got the Pro of 100 social yeah. media, you've just launched <coughs> two new ones. Tell us a little bit about. Yeah, well, I think what, what might be useful, just take, I'll take a step back and tell you about how we have approached where we think the future of news is going as a starting point. And then all of the products that uh, we've tried to develop and all of the capabilities we've tried to build to help the, uh, the Washington Post and Slate as well derive from um, those kind of higher arc arcing points. So we believe that no single publisher has enough content to satisfy a modern news consumer. So therefore, aggregation has to be a critical part of where news goes. Um, that means you could be syndicating it. It means you could be um, putting links and uh, guiding people to other websites on the web. But to be a place of first resort, to be a first tier news consumption experience, you need to hand have content that goes far beyond what you have your own staff to publish. Um, the second is that social networks and who your friends are and the wisdom of the crowds, those are not add-ons or you know widgets to be installed on the right side of a website. Those are integral parts of how content should be presented to users, but those can be an expectation. Um, and then the last piece is that personalization is going to be a core element of how all experiences are. And uh, you know, at Amazon, obviously, personalization was a very important part of how the merchandising experience was built and evolved. And um, over time, what started as a business that simply replicated what retail stores could do turned into a business that was completely unique and different than what um, any physical bookstore could uh, could accomplish. And uh, 
And so we believe that personalization is a real key part of news consumption in the future, but that it's very hard and very different than retail personalization, where um, the signal of buying an item is a really strong signal. The signal of my clicking on a catchy headline is not the same strength of signal. Um, the reasons that I read an article can be quite uh, diverse and various, and that, that's different than buying an item. So we've tried to uh, think about where personalization could really live in a news consumption experience in a way that we don't think anyone's done yet. And so um, with those as a backdrop, um, and I guess a, another key point in the evolution of where, where these products have uh, arisen is that we initially started three and a half years ago with the notion that we're going to work arm in arm with these properties, come up with ideas, help build it onto their sites, and then um, move on to the next project. And that was kind of how we saw labs. The reality, uh, once we got on the ground and started trying to work, is that they're managing their own websites to, like I said, quarter to quarter, their own priorities. You can't go in there and say, hey, I want to try out this thing. I don't know how it's going to work. Um, and uh, it has no business value in, in the near term, but you should you know, change your priorities and install this thing on the homepage of your website instead of the project you're working on that has an advertiser next to it. You know, it's just not gonna happen. And so um, we, after the team that I started building up, um, came to the conclusion about six months in that if we're gonna really try to innovate a next generation of news experience, we have to build our own products that develop its own audience and we can move as fast as we want there if we, uh, if we can build it and be successful enough to, to gather an audience. And that really led to the first product, which was a personalized news aggregator that is Trove today. Um, we learned a lot of lessons from Trove. It, uh, it engineering-wise, is very impressive. Uh, when I put my engineer's eye, I'm a developer by background, and uh, um, but as a consumer product has uh, not taken off and not been a success, and we learned a lesson that um, you can't make things too complicated. You have to make things easy enough so they can get their head around. Um, Social Reader, uh, which was our second kind of major product that's out there, really goes the other direction. It's completely implicit. It looks at what you and your friends are reading and comes up with topics based on that and what's in your Facebook profiles. And uh, that has uh, done well, though it's, though you know it's very much integrated directly into Facebook and uh, Facebook's own support for the capabilities that it used, which is this frictionless sharing uh, uh, and somewhat controversial that capability is that, has changed. And so we are actually in the midst. And we have a, actually an AU alum, Chris Drukas, who's on my team back there, who's working on the redesign of uh, Social Reader that you'll see in the next few weeks. Um, and, uh, and so that product's going through an evolution. And uh, Can you get a workaround? Can you? Well, I mean, I think we're trying, I mean, our takeaways is that we need with, uh, and I, I apologize for folks who are not super familiar with Social Reader, but you've probably even seen it on, when you're on Facebook. Most people have not been able to avoid it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the product right now very much requires that you come in through Facebook, you Facebook connected, you're given permission to share. Um, that paradigm has allowed us to gain 32 million registered users on Social Reader in a year, um, which, uh, you know, it's, it's an impressive number anyway you, you try to get around it. Um, and, uh, but we, the lessons learned is that I think people have an expectation when they click on links that they can read the article, at least a lot of people do. And, uh, and so a lot of the changes we're going to be doing is, you know, pulling out of, uh, of, of the very integrated approach that we've taken and uh, creating a standalone experience that allows people to have many different flavors of what sharing means to them. And so that's, that's the challenge in front of us. Um, and, uh, and then the other products, you know, the Root 100 apps, um, which are if you go if you have an Android device and you search on um, Root 100, you'll see a hundred apps that eat one for each honoree of this feature on the on the root of the hundred African Americans in the news. And uh, and we decided we what if you could actually build an experience at the micro level rather than focusing on a brand name. You know, if someone's a Bryce Harper fan, they're not going to download the Washington Post app because that's not going to show up in search in an app store. That's not going to be associated to Bryce Harper. And yet, the best coverage on Bryce Harper might actually be from the Washington Post. So that's a, that's a dissonance right now <coughs> how we discover apps. And so the idea with the Route 100 apps is let's build the app at the subject level that people actually care about. 
um, rather than thinking that we're going to do it for the root, let's build it so that it's the Serena Williams app. It's the Dr. Juan Gilbert app, who's, if you go to further down the, uh, the celebrity scale of the Route 100, he's a computer science professor um, uh, who, uh, who is very prominent in African American academics. And so the, um, the apps are versions of the same theme, which is uh, you know, personalized, or social, <coughs> to aggregate information from many different sources. And, uh, and then our last product that we just launched is the Fold. TV. TV. And that's in the TV space. Yeah. Um, it's different. It doesn't have anything to do with social reader. Um, and it's really built on, um, you know, one of the themes of Silicon Valley right now is mobile first, that news content should start from a uh, mobile experience <coughs> and work backwards to tablets and websites that, that forces the kind of critical thinking to define the essence of a product. And uh, I believe that that actual way of thinking is very powerful. Um, the Fold is a variant of that thinking in that we started with the connected TV experience. Uh, many of you probably watch Hulu and Netflix using your PlayStation or your Wii or uh, Xbox. And, uh, and we, um, we, going back from that, uh, said, well, how, is, how should news be presented in this type of environment? Well, if you started there, how would you build the experience? And one of the first obvious things is, well, you know, I hate it when I'm watching broadcast TV and they're covering a subject I don't care about. I should be able to skip that immediately. Um, another, uh, another really interesting problem that we saw was that you might be watching, say, a 15-minute broadcast and see a really catchy segment. And you want to share it, but you don't want to share the whole 15-minute broadcast with your friends. That has no, that's, it's that two-minute piece on this particular subject that matters. And so uh, what we've launched last week with is an app called Post TV. It's on Android tablets and on Google TV. And, uh, and it launches a program called The Fold, which is a daily, nightly newscast that um, basically is a, a modern, uh, on-demand spin on the nightly news that allows you to skip, that has more intuitive social sharing. And, uh, and we're really excited about it. And uh, Why don't we take a look? And I should add, the entire production staff of the fold pretty much is our AU alums. <laughs> Very cool. But it has little pockets of content. Do you want to play the fold video for a <coughs> second? Tonight on a jam-packed edition of The Fold, the Supreme Court hearing arguments this afternoon that could change the way universities admit students. We'll also hook up in Pakistan with an update on that, that girl who was shot down on her way home from school Keep by the Taliban, the videos, ben. all for advocating female education. We'll also do a hookup with Sweden on a much lighter and more fun story. A man there who spent three days sorting 65,000 Legos. You have to see the video of this. Uh, how are we going to get to all this? And actually, two stories I didn't have time to mention. Well, it's the productivity that you, our viewers, gave us by sending in your pet pictures. We talked yesterday about the productivity that uh, kittens and dogs can give you. Well, now, Gina Kalaski Sugar will live on my desk and hopefully bring uh, many episodes of great productivity to the show we call The Fold from the newsroom of The Washington Post. You are in The Fold. So how long does it take to produce that and what's been the response? It takes a full day um, and uh, we're learning about video on the fly. So. Uh, so we, we start in the morning, and uh, our goal is to get a 15-minute broadcast ready by the next video. <laughs> the next video. So, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, we're learning. You know, we, we are not a classical video news organization. And, uh, and so our goal is to try to become as professional um, as any of the big guys, but using modern web technologies and uh, hopefully at a fraction of the cost. And all the production on this is happening in your shop, yeah. not in the newsroom? It's in the newsroom. So in this is a partnership. Room. This is an example of a, of a good partnership where uh, um, the labs team has defined the project and defined the product, which is the Post TV app. The conception of the product led to we need a daily habitual video anchor to that product to drive people to come back led to the fold, and then we worked with Andy Pergam, who uh, used to be part of the J-Lab. Yes, um, deputy director. And, uh, and, and then helped fund um, some of the positions that have led to creating this program. And so it's, you know, it's an example of 
when you're when you're uh, when you're trying to go outside the box, it doesn't mean you throw everything away in the process. Um, so you know the, the Washington Post brand means a lot. It leads to a lot of trust. If you're starting a newscast as a startup and you're having a random brand saying, "Hey, trust us, we are quality journalism news," that'd be a hard <laughs> sell. So it would be crazy to not use the Washington Post um, brand and quality journalism there. So we use the newsroom to uh, produce the show, but. We, we've been able to define the product that, is, that it's part of. And then what we've done, and one of this is another part of uh, what I spend time thinking about is distribution and the distribution of the future that you know, more, less and less people are coming to home pages of websites. They come in through search, through social, through aggregation websites. That's just a way that everything's going. And, uh, and here, too, we've created this broadcast by building it in segments. Each of the segments are search engine optimized already, um, and then the videos themselves are distributed onto YouTube in addition to Washington Post, in addition to the apps, and so there's many different opportunities for people to see it, and uh, the hope is that you then advertise the production costs of the video um, through all these different mediums, and hopefully do it in a way that's more web-ready than um, what, a, what a more traditional cable news station would do. So multiple entry points. So that's right. Good. So what, uh, what do you wish you hadn't done? I mean, uh, talk about lessons learned. Um. Well, I mean, I think there's, there's, we've learned a lot. Uh, I think one thing I referred to earlier is that look, people are really busy online. And um, personalization is a great concept, but folks aren't going to do tons of work to configure their news experience. Maybe a few people will. Um, maybe a lot of the people that are in this room might but you're not the general population um, by any sh shot. And so um, understanding kind of, if you're building something for a mass consumer audience, then you have to have mass consumer sensibilities that, that it has to be really easy, it has to make sense, um, it has to not feel like a lot of work, you only have their attention for a few brief moments. Um, the other thing that, uh, that was probably one of the, uh, the, one of the more embarrassing lessons learned is that, is that we, tend to be, and you probably will be in the same way, in a bubble um, as far as what kind of normal sensibilities are. And um, so I'm in my, within my team uh, in, in 2010 and 11, we were infatuated what, by, uh, I don't know how many of you know, Next Media Animation. It's this uh, Taiwanese um, animation house that does news roundups using this, an this quick animation style. And uh, they've had some very famous videos uh, of uh, Sarah Palin and, uh, and, and the president uh, at different times. And we ended up actually meeting them and befriending them. And they offered, hey, we'll help you with the tutorial video for Trove, our personalized news aggregator, when you're ready. So we went to them. We wrote a script. We thought it was hilarious. Um, and uh, and we, launched, we launched this video. And uh, it was basically a total disaster for tutorial because, uh, <laughs> well, first, it was in Mandarin with subtitles, um, <laughs> which, uh, which most people immediately didn't understand. Let's and, show. Uh, and maybe I'll show you that. I'll tell you all the things wrong with it. That, uh, Let's show and see what happens it. when you work from the bubble. Okay. <laughs> we're going to stop there. If you, you want to see the rest of it, it's on YouTube. Just a search on Welcome to Trove, and uh, you'll find it. It got incredibly good reviews from the media elite covering the launch, and to that extent it was successful. But the reality is that the mass consumer who was trying the product out the first time, they were basically like, what the hell is this? And, uh, and uh, something's broken. I'm only seeing this in Mandarin. Um, so, this is what my father said when he saw it. He was like, and so um, what was funny to us and clever, basically you can't be as clever when you're trying to build a mass product. Um, you have to think about you know, people who are much less facile on, you know, using online tools and, and, and getting them into it. And as it was, we had a very complex concept to get in that, hey, this is a site where you get your news, but you can put your interests in and it can cover anything, your favorite TV show, to your favorite sports team, to your favorite politician, to, and uh, that's, that's a hard concept and you have to uh, take that very seriously and not, um, and not think that people will get your inside jokes and think they're hilarious as you, you do. Mm -hmm. so, so that was that was that was a big one for us. 
you know, usability. Um, you know, the social reader, we try to error to the other side and just make it, you know, work from the beginning, no configuration necessary, just accept the permissions and boom, you're there. Um, and uh, and you know, we're trying to find a happy medium now that for power users, it's a little unsatisfying and we think there's an opportunity. Like they don't even know, most people don't know there's a personalization engine driving social reader. They just see that their friends read something and therefore they click through, which is not a bad thing. They don't need to appreciate our engineering and technology and whiz bang this behind the scenes. They just need to have a good experience and want to come back again. That's what you want. Um, but, uh, but there's more work to be done, especially in, in being more privacy sensitive and, uh, and understanding uh, some, of the, some of the complexity of living in a Facebook world today and how sharing works. It's, uh, you know, it's not easy for, for the average user. Well, now, you're an entrepreneur. You work in not, in, not only inside the post, but there's also Slate and The Root and other posts, uh, whatever, subsidiaries. How do, you, how do you get ideas for what you want to develop? Is it gut? Is it intuition? Is it market research? Do you just do something because you think it's cool? I mean... <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, it's a little bit of everything in, under the sun as a starting you know, germ, and then from there, a combination. I mean, I think we, we position our team as an idea clearinghouse, and which means that ideas can come from any parts of the company and even from outside. Um, and some of our best ideas have come from um, engineers on the team um, through things like hackathons. There's actually been productive stuff that have come out of that. Uh, some of the ideas have come from market research. I mean, the, the market research around cord cutters is overwhelmingly, in, you know, as far as the, the population of people that are, you know, leaving, leaving cable relying on these internet connected devices that is just going to grow and grow and so the space feels like green field. So in that particular case it's part research and part gut saying okay this is something that it will be hard for any of the operating units to justify working on because it's a three year, five year trend. We should try to work on it and get some headway going um, because it has really important implications not just to building a good app but um, much like with journalism in general, it has implications for how the videos themselves are created. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges we as a news organization have is that it's not just that we have to build a good website, it's that we have to rethink how we build our journalism. You know, our content can't, you know, a 10, a ten page uh, news story that would have worked great for the Outlook section of the post, um, you know, we need to be thinking about online. Is it still going to look the same way? Could have been done in eight pieces? Um, could parts of it have been background material for the deep reader to go into if they really wanted to after getting the lighter read? I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of ramifications of our move online that have to do with actually what the content you create, not how you present it. And so the architecture of the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it has, it sweeps through. And so in the case of our Connected TV app, we believe it sweeps through to the level of don't shoot one 15-minute video shoot six two-minute videos, put it together. Buckets, like little yeah. buckets of content. Mm -hmm. Well, how competitive are you with other media companies? Do you share information? Do you collaborate? Is it all hush-hush until you launch your thing? Well, I tell you, I, I mean, compared to Amazon, where we were extremely hush-hush, and um, you know, there was essentially no collaboration with eBay or Google, um, you know, the media industry is different. Um, there is a lot more uh, conversation. Collaboration is a strong word, um, but, uh, but I think there's a lot more idea exchange in that and, uh, and conversation with other media companies who, in theory, you're in competitiveness with. But, um, and I think that's, a lot of that is actually the legacy of the fact in the print world, none of these guys were really competing with each other. Um, anymore. So, <laughs> anymore. And, and, and so, because they were just in their local DMAs. And so, um, there is more information exchange and community to, to the media industry. There's very little still collaboration in that you don't work on efforts together. Um, there's still, and I, I think that's, that's too bad because I think there's a lot of opportunities for um, the sum being greater than the parts if they did, mm -hmm. that you know, some organizations do <coughs> infographics better than other organizations and some people have better, so there, there should be opportunities to, uh, to just all, all those different uh, elements across it, but that's not, the industry is not there yet. Right. What would it take to incentivize that, or could it? Well, I think as long as, this is where the business side comes in, um, you know, if you want to look at, like, one element of digital news that um, pervasively influences how news sites are built, 
display advertising drives a lot of behavior. Um, it, it creates incentives to not have links to other people's sites, even though that would be the best thing for the reader, um, and could lead your site to be more of a place of first resort in the long term. It leads for, you know, Farhad Manju, I think, had this great story on how ah. stupid pagination is on, on a site. Like, there's just nothing gained from paginating a long <coughs> story to, like, four different subpages, except that you make more money from display ads. And that's historically why that stuff exists, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, anachronistic at this point. Um, and, uh, and so display advertising has had a, a, a profound effect on how free news sites have been constructed, and, uh, and even paid sites, because they still mostly do advertising. You know, even if you're on the Wall Street Journal, they're, they're selling ads. So that, the site architecture is built off of that. That also leads you to be less likely to collaborate, because um, you want the display ads. You don't want them to get it. And, uh, and, and then even if you shared it, who's going to sell it? And is it going to be part of this bundle or that bundle? And they're going to sell it at a cheap rate. And it just gets, it gets completely tied into a Gordian knot, and you mm -hmm. can't really pull it back out. And so um, that business model, I think, will always be in the way. And, and I, don't, I don't really think that gets better if there's a meter paywall or anything else. So it's, uh, it's probably intractable to some extent for now. Now, have you developed yet things, uh, are you sniffing around things where venture capitalists will come to you and say, you know, it's nice that you're doing that inside the post, but we think we could roll it out or help you roll it out or do something where you franchise it across the board or? Um, not so much venture capitalists. Um, I mean, I think other news organizations who are not, the post is a very unique news organization. It's not a national, um, you know, legacy distribution like Wall Street Journal and New York Times. Um, it has a national and international website and a national and international brand um, that you know, largely took Watergate and the Pentagon Papers, et cetera. And, and yet, and so there's a lot of other local news organizations from the print world who see us and say, you're, you're able to build all these things because you're, you're kind of a super local in a lot of ways, and it's very unique. Um, you know, even if you look at a lot of things we do versus versus some of the other large city, you know, news organizations, it's, there's something very unique about the Washington Post and the seat of seat of American power and the DC market, and that has uh, lent itself. So we work on a lot of things that we see um, opportunities to collaborate with other news organizations that that are um, looking in a local context. So one example is a project that my team and the newspaper um, unit are working on together called Service Alley where this is a, known as a free Angie's List, so it's a, um, it's a home services directory that allows you to, if you want to find an electrician or a plumber, uh, many of you probably do not have this problem as students, but um, for anyone who has a house, there's, all, there's a myriad of uh, vendors that you need for random things. And so the um, so service alley was built as a DC product for finding home services, but built in a way, and this is part of being intentionally creating a product that could uh, could go further, built in a way that it can be franchised. And so Chicago Tribune has franchised it, launched it in Chicago, and they have their own service alley um, running off the same software that um, my team supports and builds on. Um, but they do the marketing. They put the links on their website. They have a salesperson helping uh, uh, get merchants to convert to pro accounts. And uh, we've since launched in Raleigh with a TV station in Baltimore. And so the idea is that Okay, so something like that is a great local innovation. Um, could be, you know, a next generation classified product for us, and we have no problem. In fact, we're, we're, we're the sum is greater than the part if we can get more and more cities to adopt it because your search engine ranking will go up. There's extra revenue to pour into, pour into actually developing the product. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons that would that getting more people onto the platform would be good. And so, so there we've seen that, but. Uh, but that's, you know, it's not display advertising driven, it's different. Terminate yeah. some start advertising. And that's <laughs> true, that's true. <laughs> well, so you're a separate operation in the newsroom. I mean, if you look at a lot of the conventional literature about entrepreneurship, they talk about how hard it is to get old organizations to embrace new ideas. Yeah. How, how important is, is it to you that you are WAPO Labs and you're, you're kind of, you're of, but you're apart from the yeah. newsroom? Um, yeah, that's been a very tricky thing. Uh, you know, it's not a startup where you're completely working independently, which, which I did prior to coming here. Um, it's not like working at Amazon where you're all part of one bigger team. It's something in between. It's kind of hard to describe. Um, the, 
being separate has been very important because and being separate with your own budget allocated to work with gives you the independence to um, believe in ideas and actually see it through to being completion. So I'm not arguing with a PowerPoint presentation for someone else to do something. That's a really terrible place to be, and, uh, and you don't want to do that. So, so we've been able to uh, create our own momentum um, through the combination of having a budget and having a really talented staff that we've been able to attract um, to, uh, to execute on some of these ideas. Being, being still of allows us, like I mentioned, to smartly think about the future of the brand and the journalism and the, and the core qualities of what the Washington Post is and how those can be put into play um, in different new ways that uh, might be hard to, to envision. And so, um, you know, with the, uh, one of the very early experiments we did was we, we launched a site that is still running today called Reach for the Wall. It's a, it's a swimming site for local DC, Maryland area um, swim teams that, uh, that is built on a wiki platform that allows the swimmers and the teams to actually fill out their own team pages. There's one Washington Post person at the front page that um, fills in the home page. And it's a great marriage because that one editor lends incredible credibility for the families and the coaches to take the trouble to put content into the system. Um, at the same time, in the future where news is going, you can't have eight people covering local swimming in the DC market. There's just not a business around that. And so you can build products that use the Washington Post brand, use the journalists and the journalism to, in a way that makes sense for the future, but then still try to serve the community in some useful manner. So that's, it's that happy spot that we're trying to get to. So when someone in the newsroom sees you coming, is it like a public editor, oh no, <laughs> coming? Or do they, do they embrace you and say, yay, <laughs> what's he got up his sleeve now? The newsroom, I mean, probably, I mean the, big, the biggest benefit of the way, the timing of when I arrive in the team is that the newsroom gets that tremendous change is needed for the future of their craft. And so um, because of that, they're very open to a lot of ideas. Um, and uh, as long as you don't, I mean, I think where they become sensitive is, has as much to do about like, the subject matter that are covered. Like, I mean, one of the things about social reader is that, so Jersey Shore and Teen Moms have been two of the most, by far two of the most popular topics read on social reader. And people like reading about Jersey Shore and Teen Mom. I mean, there's just no way around that. And it is hard for a newsroom of the Washington Post to you know, hear me say, you know, if, there's one, if they ask, like, what's the one thing we should do? I was like, hire a reporter to cover Teen Mom and Jersey Shore. <laughs> <laughs> because, because the reading public actually cares. Like, they want to read that. And uh, that's a hard thing to swallow, because it's, you know, it doesn't, well, it doesn't fit our brand. And, but, um, you know, one of the mantras when I was at Amazon was, you know, you start with the customer and you work backwards, and uh, and that's, you know, that's something we have to do in, in the online space. It's very easy to evaluate what people want, and you have to figure out. I think as a news organization, they've been pretty progressive, and um, you know, you look at on the homepage of the Washington Post, they have this in the news widget, sort of trending topics, and they skew into entertainment quite a bit, um, you know, and uh, and I think that's a good thing. Readers want that, and I think. To be a place of first resort, you have to be, you have to start to address comprehensiveness and not be all about you know the highfalutin topics that you're focused on. But then, how do you get the eat, eat your broccoli journalism done, or how do you how do you hook people into important issues, or do you? Can well, you I think it, well, um, I think for a certain amount of population, I think they you can over time um, through the adjacency of you might bring them in on Jersey Shore, but then be able to introduce them to other topics that they care about. But, uh, but there's also, I mean, people, much like with music, you don't buy the whole album anymore. It's, if you don't want to read about the, the girl in Pakistan who got shot, then you don't have to read about the girl in Pakistan who got shot. And that's terrible because it's a huge story and people should care about it. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that's, that's the, the choice is there to go somewhere else instead. Um, and I think a blending of, you know, the, to me, the news experience of the future is a blend between editorial judgment that you should care about, you know, the, the top story from yesterday, this is what happened in Pakistan, and w the wisdom of, your, of the crowd and the friends that, you know, everyone's reading the story, and your personal interests. Mm -hmm. And if you can blend those together in the right way, I think most consumers will appreciate that. Um, there'll be some who just want to see only their interests or only what their friends are reading. 
But I think most people do want to know about what's the most important story. Um, they do want to be informed, um, but they don't want to do it at the sacrifice of the stuff they care about, which might be for the short moment. Mm -hmm. So tell the students in here, who are you hiring? Who are you hiring for jobs? What kind of skills do they need? Yeah. How many people do you have? Yeah, so the team is uh, around 40 folks, which is much bigger than we ever set out to be. And a lot of that is on the backs of Social Reader and uh, needing to build out the team. We have a five-person editorial team, but their editorial job is nothing like probably what you would imagine. Um, they're in our semantic content system, helping tune the algorithms of how we apply the news out of, uh, out of, the, out of the web. They're uh, you know, obviously doing a lot of social media-oriented journalism. Um, you know, we hire a lot of software engineers, and uh, if there's one, if there's one thing, and you know, I'm biased. I'm a developer by by background. Is you know, learn the program, you know, whether it's JavaScript, CSS, HTML, something. I think if you're in journalism and you're not learning how to uh, do at least the basics of building a website and uh, query a database, um, then those are those are the the storytelling capabilities of the future, just like the pen and pencil and uh, copy editing. And so. Um, you know, we, we hire our, engin our engineering team is about seventy percent of the staff, and uh, and they're all pa they're not down heads down engineers who uh, don't care that they're working in the news industry. They actually care a lot about the quality <coughs> of the journalists, and, and they read the news and they go to websites themselves. And but um, they have uh, their technical skills are you know there. That's that's just super important. So I'm going to ask a question, and this is going to be my last question before I turn it over to <laughs> questions from the audience. So start framing your questions now, and put your hand up, and a mic will come to you. Okay. Um, I wanted to. What does product development look like for you? I mean, is it a PowerPoint? Is it a wireframe? Are you building your own little iPhone, iPady things um, in the lab? <laughs> I mean, what do, what does it look like for you? I mean, it's all of them. Uh, it's all of those things at different points in the cycle, right? So, um, you know, we our approach is to be a clearinghouse of ideas, and people express ideas in a lot of different ways. Um, some wireframe the idea, some put it into a PowerPoint presentation, some write a narrative, um, and uh, and some can code enough to be able to. And, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I think basic coding skills can be very powerful is that you can convey an idea in a way that a narrative and, and in this world. The interaction and things can really convey ideas in a way that you can't otherwise. But um, products are born in a lot of different manners. Um, we um, ha are an evolving small to now medium sized team that uh, probably is not strong on process. So we don't have an ISO 9001 doc that people have to fill out that uh, captures all the functional requirements. Um, so we're still a work in progress. But essentially, we um, you know, we try to get to the essence of what's the user experience you're trying to evoke, and uh, and why would they want to use the thing that you're thinking about? Why would they discover it? Why would they use it? And how do you test it? How do you know if it works? Um, you know, we at different points we can do different types of evaluations. You know, later in the process we can do user testing against some of the concepts. Um, use use users to help us um, be. Uh, but a lot of it is gut instinct and uh, and and being able to visualize you know, something that we think will be successful. Cool. Very exciting stuff. How about some questions from the audience? Tom. Yeah. Tom Davidson from PBS. Thanks, Shane. You used a job title earlier that I want you to talk more about. You said product manager. I'm just a dumb journalist. What is that? Product so manager. yeah, so a product manager, and this is a this is a job role that varies company to company. I would say that um, unlike a software developer, which is fairly consistent in responsibilities <coughs> wherever you go, um, different companies have different uh, sets of roles that encompass a product manager. But um, by and by and large, and in our in our specific case, you know, a product manager is someone who oversees. The conception, design, and development and deployment of, of a product, which we consider, you know, consumer-facing experience, a service that another part of the company might use. So, a product is Social Reader, it's Trove, it's the Route 100 apps. Um, in the case of the Route 100 apps, it's 
the underlying technical product we developed, which we call App Factory, which is a factory for, for creating topical-based news apps um, that we hope to deploy in a lot of different ways in the future. And, uh, and so the product manager is responsible for coordinating designers for um, you know, owning and, res and uh, the success of the, de the deployment of the product, that it meets really good user experience, and uh, they're, res they're responsible for voicing the, uh, the voice of the consumer in that process. So a lot of different things. Um, they have to interact with engineers. Um, <coughs> so you wear a lot of different hats. Um, and different product managers on a team bring different strengths. So we have some product managers who are former designers. We have some product managers who are former developers. Um, and some who uh, are, you know, coming from a data scientist, you know, background, like a statistician background, and um, there's no set track to get to that kind of a role. Good. More questions? Dina. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about the fold, um, which I'm intrigued by, especially as news organizations, you know, want to utilize video but aren't really sure how. Um, you know, you mentioned that you have to think about the audience first and then kind of work on the product from there. So I'm just wondering, who do you see the audience for the fold being, and also kind of what does success look like if it yeah. does well? It's a great so question. See. So um, the fold post TV, which was really the the ink, the the the. Uh, product that launched the fold is envisioned as a news cons news video product for cord cutters um, first and foremost now we make it available in a lot of different ways and many of the people watching it probably have cable and so that's but that was that was the consumer in mind that we tried to walk backwards from on what the experience was so we were literally when we were talking through the idea a year ago or maybe nine months ago the uh, the idea was okay you're someone who's cut cable you're using Hulu and Netflix to get your entertainment. You come home from work. You are going to start preheating the oven or boiling water for pasta or what, whatever you do. And before you cut cable, you would flip CNN on or MSNBC or Fox and just let it run in the background um, and kind of osmosis-wise kind of pick up what happened in the world news-wise. Well, you don't have that anymore because you've cut cable. And the news products on these connected TV devices either throw up a random set of videos with no editorial voice and organization to it, or they're Google Hangouts, and that you, you would never learn about what happened in the world in 15 minutes or 30 minutes from watching eight hours of Google Hangouts from some of the <coughs> news organizations have developed. So, um, so we wanted to create an app that you wanted to launch that would actually fill that need of you know, a concise uh, nightly newscast for an on-demand world. We took the assumption, like we do with all our products, that the majority of users will be leaning back. They won't have the remote control in their hands. They won't be pushing a ton of buttons. They're going to launch the app, and they're going to walk away because they're doing something else while it's running. And that um, for a few people, they will grab the remote and want to take action or hear something that makes them stand up and want to go, go back to, to paying attention. And for them, they're going to want to skip something they're not interested in. They're going to want to share socially in a way that makes sense to them. And, uh, and we wanted to enable that. But that was one of the things you're in an on-demand world, enable on-demand type behavior. And then the long-term vision is that it's a hub, that we have other programs that we can introduce to them, that over time, if they come in and launch this app at 2 PM, we might have a more relevant program at 2 PM than last night's The Fold. Um, and that, uh, and that it, in, over time, if we're able to show traction and success, that we'll do that. So how do we define traction? Um, you know, right now, it's actually fairly qualitative. You know, like I'm very proud of the fact that we have a 4.8 star rating in the, in the Google Play Store right now. And we've had 20 reviews. They've been all you know, four or five stars. The, uh, the user reviews have been very authentic and, and positive and encouraging for what we're doing. That, it feels different, it feels hipper, it feels more of their age than, uh, and it's not, you know, uh, a lot of people yelling at each other like what most newscasts after 6.30 are like. On, uh, and so, so there seems to be something there. I think we've hit, we've hit a chord qualitatively. Quantitatively in the long term, um, you know, we want user adoption. You know, we've, we'd like to have thousands of tens of thousands of users um, of this app over time. Some of that will have to wait for these platforms to get more and more adoption. So where a labs team can be more patient um, is an advantage. 
Uh, and then there's a business strategy that under roots it that's very important, which is that if you look at advertising for news right now, um, display advertising is extremely challenged, right? So there are, there's ad networks and Facebook and a lot of different places for advertisers to go with flat display ads that challenge the, uh, the value of display advertising on news sites. But video pre-roll advertising is very strong. Um, and it's strong both because it has a really high value to advertisers that is hard to replace with what these other you know, sites are being able to do. It's also strong in that you can't, um, you know, a lot of our content, like if we will, I mean, this happens all the time for us, we'll have a reporter do seminal reporting on some major topic, and then immediately there's 40 sites that will write a two paragraph cut and paste and then a few sentences around it. And you know, within seconds, it's drowned out in Google News and other aggregators by the, the uh, cacophony of other sites that have lifted key pieces and boiled it down to the salient bits. Um, video actually is very interesting because it's actually harder to do such a thing. And, uh, and so I think a big part of the future of news is, uh, is developing a much better balance between video and text-oriented storytelling. Um, because it has, it has, it rewards the original storyteller in a way that um, has a little bit more long-term sustainability. So that's kind of a long-winded answer around uh, how we think about the product. Question. That's cool. Yes, Wendell. Here. So uh, I find the name the fold ironic for a startup business, but my question is more. So you, I would actually like to hear a little bit about the name. But my question is more serious. We keep hearing people talk about fail fast. Mm -hmm. How do you know when it's done or when it's just not going to work? It's not worth rolling out. How do you make those? How do you kill your own children? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> That's from the former division director. Right. Right. Well, um, it is an, it is important to fail fast when you know for sure that something fails, but. Um, that should only have, I mean, so I'll, let me tell you a short story first. So I, I worked on the first Amazon auction site. It was a 10-person commando team in 1999 that was going to take on eBay head-to-head. -head. And uh, in three months, we built a site that was as featured as eBay. We launched it. It was an engineering marvel and a total business disaster. Um, <laughs> people didn't b go there to buy. People didn't want to sell because no one was buying, and it never got off the ground. But the vision of third-party goods was a really strong vision. And so we, as Amazon, the company st stuck by it and did three more iterations of auctions. We went, we did this thing called Z-Shops, we did a thing called um, uh, Storefronts, and then eventually we hit on, if we combined sh showing third-party products with Amazon retail products on one product page, that the value proposition would be clearer for third-party products because there were cases where you would buy used and, and buy it for less than that would be okay. And, uh, and, and it took literally four years for, for that. And so in that particular case, we didn't fail fast. We instead had a core belief third-party products uh, would, uh, would re re eventually create more selection to users, more selections to users uh, relates to better business in retail. And, uh, and so we stuck with it. And, and so the way that I interpret the fail fast mantra is if you have a core tenant that actually has a hole blown in it after you launch, but you realize that one of your assumptions is completely off, um, that, uh, that people didn't actually value it or they're reacting in a totally different way. So one example was uh, when we launched Trove, we thought the hosting of, con of Washington Post content would be a value add to the Trove experience. It was only after launching it that we realized that uh, users very rarely ran into Washington Post content when you're aggregating 15,000 news sources. And, uh, and it should have been obvious, but it wasn't until we launched. And so the hosting feature is you know, not considered important now. And, you know, and so I think you have to, but I, I really take it back to when you go into doing a product, you have a core tenant um, or a set of core tenants or key assumptions. And, and if your assumptions are still correct, then you go back and you say, well, I haven't executed on the product correctly. So, so like for instance, Trove is not a commercial success, but it hasn't shaken my belief that personalization is important. And in fact, our latest spin on personalization, Personal Post, which runs inside of WashingtonPost.com, you'll see it on the right rail um, underneath, the, underneath the ad, is, uh, is really proving out increasing engagement on the Washington Post site. So it's the third try at that. Um, but 
we never we didn't stray from the fact that we thought we instead critiqued our own ability to create a valuable user experience that made sense and decided we weren't very good at that in the first two tries and so third try better. Oh, good question. Yeah. One, more. one more back here. Uh, not to make an assumption, but it seems like you use some sort of uh, text analytics to pull content for the uh, for the social reader and some mm -hmm. of the other sites. Yeah. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit about uh, where you've seen that technology grow from and where you see it going in the uh, in the next five years or so? Yeah, that's a that's a great question and uh, and one that is really a core piece of how personalization for news can work is that you have to understand the essence of, a, of what an article is talking about. If you don't know that, how are you going to personalize delivering new content based on people's interests? And so we, um, to go backwards for a second on the history of, uh, so Trove is our both our consumer-facing product and our underlying semantic platform that's in-house that delivers content based on topics. And it harvests content from 15,000 news sources, and then you as an application can decide, I'm only going to show Washington Post content, this is how Personal Post works. I'm only going to show those who I have syndication agreements with, this is how Social Reader works. Or I'm going to show the whole web and just have links like Google News, Metro.com works. Um, the, the technology, we started actually looking at trying to build ourselves, realized we didn't have the background in natural language processing and machine learning to do it well. Um, we looked at licensing some technology, but couldn't get to good agreements. And we actually ended up acquiring a small company that was about to go out of business called iCurrent. Um, and uh, they were a California-based startup in the personalized news space. And uh, they make up um, the bulk of the lab San Francisco office, where about a third of my team uh, works. And uh, that core platform does a few simple things. It pulls content from a variety of news, si news sites using the RSS feeds that the sites publicly expose. It um, extracts the entities, the nouns that are present in the content. It um, evaluates categorically what that content is about um, using. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. I'm Amy Eisman. I'm the director of the master's program in media entrepreneurship here at American University. We're one of your hosts this week, this evening with WAMU, also a co-sponsor. And also, I um, want to promise you a lively evening to get you over the depression of the Nats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, before I introduce our guests, I want to thank a few people here. But first, I want to share a few words about why we are here today. There are two ways to look at the rollicking, frolicking, topsy-turvy world of media and information today. Um, where nouns like Facebook and Instagram and Storify become first. I Storify did, Facebooked him, and Instagram did. One way to handle the new reality is to lament the way things used to be in newspapers or in TV or in industries. Or, like many of you here tonight, we can decide to jump in and play, think of new ideas, explore new ways to pay for those ideas, create new products, and have the confidence to let some of them fail. That's why we here at American University started a new program in media entrepreneurship, um, which I'd like the students who are in that program to raise their hands so everybody can acknowledge them. Woohoo! They're the first class. And why the smart folks at WAMU helped co sponsor this program, both WAMU and the Media Entrepreneurship Program together. So, with us tonight are two people who love the idea of rolling up their sleeves and diving in. The moderator is Jan Schaefer. She's the nationally known expert in media entrepreneurship and an undisputed leader in innovative ways to think about journalism. She's the entrepreneur in residence on campus, and she's also the executive director of JLab, AU's Institute for Interactive Journalism. Jan is also a Pulitzer Prize winner for the Philadelphia Inquirer, who left daily journalism in 1994 to lead groundbreaking initiatives in civic journalism, interactive journalism, and citizen media ventures. She has awarded roughly 70 startups, Jen, with funding um, over the recent years. She knows how to spot winners, so I would, you know, cozy up to her. And uh, she's got about 20 more in the pipeline that are on their way to fruition right now. Um, our main speaker is Vijay Ravindran, the senior vice president and first ever chief digital officer for the Washington Post Company, 
which he joined uh, about three years ago? Two three and a half. Yeah. Three and a half years ago. But Jay defines the contemporary intrapreneur. He focuses on digital news product development from the inside. But Jay founded the WAPO Labs, which develop experimental news products, some of which he will discuss tonight, like the Fold. Have all of you heard of the Fold? All right, one. Okay, a couple of <laughs> Okay, next time you'll all raise your hands. Uh, he also works with Social Code, um, a Facebook, Twitter dedicated advertising company. Earlier, Vijay worked as the chief technology officer at Catalyst, a startup for political technology that built a national voter database and data mining tools for political campaigns. And he was a technology director at Amazon.com. Finally, I want to introduce a few other people. Our new dean, Dr. Jeff Rutenbeck, who has been so enthusiastic about the entrepreneurship program, you wouldn't know he's only been here for a few months. I'd also like to introduce Karen Mathis, the head of WAMU, and also one of the people responsible for this event. I also want to introduce, let's see, Roseanne, are you in here? Uh, Associate Dean uh, of the School of Communication, Roseanne Robertson. I've seen a couple division directors, John Douglas of the Film Division, uh, FMA Division. Uh, Jill Olmsted, are you here? Mm -hmm. I see Jill Olmsted. She's the division director for journalism. And thank you all for being here. For being here.